So this is one of the uh, job search basics that we we present specifically for teacher candidates, and I recognize some of you came to the resume ones. This is making employer contacts and interviewing. And my name's Jennifer McLaughlin. I work for Career Services, and many, I've met many of you. I'm going to be presenting the part on interviewing. And then Dr. Jean Eagle, who a lot of you know, official title, Director of Clinical Experiences and School Partnerships, who has been a principal who's worked in human resources and has a lot of really good hands-on experience is going to give you kind of the, the uh, let me tell you, this is what Jennifer said, now let me tell you what really happens part. Uh, so please feel free to, to ask questions when, when either one of us are speaking, but especially when Dr. Eagle is speaking, because you're not going to get this opportunity very often to actually ask questions of somebody who's been there and done that. I want to point out a couple of handouts that you were given. If you all picked up the 2014 Job Search Handbook, this is, this is excellent. I don't know if you have read this before, but it really is excellent. It talks about interviewing, resumes, your portfolio. Uh, it, it's developed by people in the field. And if you don't read anything else but this, please do. I think you'll get a lot out of it. And then the Our Purple Employment Guide for Teacher Candidates. And the job search timetable that's in there is from last year. But we had so many of them, I didn't want to throw them away. So the, the goldenrod form is, is this year. So replace the one that's in there with this goldenrod form, and, and you'll be OK. There are a number of ways to identify opportunities when you are looking for a job. One of them is to, let's say, for example, you want to go back to your home school. And you've been networking with your old teachers. And some of them say to you, I will let you know if I hear anything. Or I know that so-and-so is going to be retiring or is going to be leaving. You know, that, could be, that would be a response on your part to an actual or anticipated job opening. Then you can also prospect geographically. How many of you plan to leave the Ohio area? OK, maybe a third of you. How do you do that? Are some of you going back to your home because you live in another state? No? How are you planning on doing that? Just, just kind of curiosity. Where do you want to move? Tennessee. Tennessee. All right. What I'm going to do after this program, or tomorrow or the next day, is I'm going to send you a couple of links. And they are links to school districts you know, all over the country. You know, that, that's one way that you can, you can find out, is to prospect geographically, look on their websites, find out, for example, do they use AppleTrack or one of those, or are they in a consortium? So you're going to have to do probably a lot of legwork if you're going to be prospecting geographically. And then networking. Anybody have a LinkedIn account? That's one of the things I'm going to be asking Dr. Eagle is, how do you think um, the use of social media is being used in education? You know, it's kind of a, if you were in business, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But networking can be done via social media, or it can be done the old-fashioned way is. Who do you know that knows somebody, or contact the Miami Alumni Association in Nashville, Tennessee, and call somebody up and talk to them? about it. But these are all excellent ways for you to identify the possibility of vacancies out there. And these are the links that I'm going to be sending you, school district research, Department of Education by state, geographic resources, etc. Because if you, one thing, and you probably already know this, if you are going to be going to another state, you want to make sure that you have an understanding of what the licensure certification is about before you you actually get there to make sure that you have what, what it takes. So this is, this is our website. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I'm going to send it to you instead. But on our internet resource page, there are, as I said before, information on certification and licensure, school information, job listings, and if you're interested in going into higher education. Is anybody interested in teaching abroad? If you are, you know somebody who is, the University of Northern Iowa every year puts on this fantastic overseas recruiting fair. And they also have some interesting 
links on their website. It's going to be January 31st to February 2nd. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If any of you are interested or know somebody who's interested, come up and take a look at this because it's, it's a really good way of finding out more about what kinds of organizations you can work through if you want to teach abroad. And there's also a couple of good articles in here. All right, when to make contact. How many of you are graduating in December? Okay. How many of you have started kind of doing your research to find out what might be out there? Okay. It's kind of hard in, if you're a December grad because maybe there may be some long-term substitute positions or there may be some positions that come open, but it, it's kind of a hard time. I would say that if you haven't started looking or you haven't started doing your research, by now you want to start. Even if that essentially means looking on schools' websites, figuring out if I want to do substitute teaching. How many of you are planning on doing substitute teaching? Okay, that, that probably is the thing to do. Finding out if you need to get, what, what you need to do to make sure that you have all the paperwork filled out so that you can, you can start getting those uh, uh, substitute positions as quickly as you can when the school semester begins in January. Follow up, so when you do make contact, you want to make sure that you follow up. Don't just assume that they're going to get in touch with you. And, you know, again, network, 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 network. May grads. The hard thing, and the hard thing for many of you, and I see a lot of you, and you are ready. You are ready now. How many of you are ready now to start looking and to start interviewing and to, you know, nail down a job? Okay? Yeah, and the rest of you are not probably telling the truth. You're ready because your business major friends, some of them, how many of you have business major friends who have jobs? Yeah. And then they look at you and they don't quite get what your job search is like or how, you know, it, it doesn't really start until, you know, next year. And they've already got a job. You know, they're also the ones that are telling you, giving you advice about your resume. And if you, for those of you who were here the last time, remember I told you to ignore them. Be polite, but ignore them, because their job search is totally different. Um, in February and March, there may be, you know, people, is that the time when they usually let the school districts know if they're going to retire? Typically, at the end of January, mid-February. Okay, so the end of January, mid-February, school districts may know who's going to retire. But contracts are usually not signed until the summer. So you've got to, when? June 30. June 30. So you've got this whole wide range of time to figure out what you're going to do and what school districts you're interested in. But you may not, at this particular point in time, know if there's going to be a job. So you do some prospecting, you do your research, again, you figure out how do I apply, and if they do have a consortium or Applitrack, and I'm, I've asked Jean to, Dr. Eagle to talk a little bit more about that, if you can go ahead and, and get your, um, take the test and get your um, um, information in there, go ahead and, and do that. And then again, make sure that you understand what the requirements are for substitute teaching. Networking, this is, this is this is you in the middle. And networking, I realize for some people, is not very comfortable. But it's probably one of the best ways to find out if there's a job in a school district that maybe you, don't, you have contacts in or maybe you don't have contacts in. So if you tell your, one of your teachers from one of your districts or from the district that you're substitute teaching in or that you have done your student teaching in, what you're interested in and that you're really interested in that particular district, or you tell a relative, or anybody in a sorority or fraternity, use your alumni network there. You know, use the Miami network. Let people know where you're interested in teaching so that they can keep their ears open. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, yeah, I got a call from the mother of one of my friends who happens to know the principal of the school, you know, et cetera, and there's a job opening. Um, so, you know, you, you should apply, and this is the name of the person to, to apply to. So that's what, net networking may take some time, but networking is probably one of the better ways, at least in my opinion, of finding out what those positions are, next to actually looking on the website. But when I'm talking about networking, you sometimes find out about it before it's even on their website or it's, or it's made public. 
So interviewing, so you've identified positions, you applied for positions, you have your resume in order, now you're going to interview. We're gonna spend maybe the next half hour or so talking about kind of the basics of interviewing. Because when you've, you've written your resume, you've reflected on that, you, know, you have a good idea, hopefully, of what your skills are and what experiences that you have encountered, either student teaching or in some of your activities, that you want to talk about. So we're going to talk about the types and styles of interviewing. How do you prepare for an interview? Because really, interviewing is practice. How many of you have done a mock interview through us? OK, did it help, do you think? Okay, would you do another one? Okay. We have mock interviews, daily mock interviews that are recorded, that if you've not done one of those, is that what you, did you do the recorded one? I did one through School Music. Oh, okay, through School Music. If you've not done a recorded one, I would suggest that you do so. Because until you see yourself on tape, you don't really understand how you come across to somebody else. And then, Next semester, we don't have a date yet, but it will be before teacher job fair. We're also going to have um, one of our teacher mock interview days where we bring in people like Dr. Eagle who interview people all the time to do mock interviews with you. They won't be videotaped, but the good thing about those is it's going to be somebody who actually interviews people and hires people. So the feedback that they can provide you is going to be real life. So I, I would really encourage you to do that if you can. Even if you're student teaching, we try to have them at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock so that you can, you can come back and do it. And we try to, to make sure that everybody has an opportunity. Behavioral interviewing. That's the interview where somebody says, give me an example of a time, where they want you to walk them through something that you've done. And the philosophy behind that, as you will learn, is what you've done in the past is a good indication of what you're going to do in the future. So how you've handled a parent who is upset with something that you've done in the past while you were student teaching is a good example of possibly how you're going to handle it in the future. And the CAR method is, is a way of developing an answer for a behavioral question. And then we're going to talk about there are examples of interview questions in the AAEE guide as well as in the employment guide. And you can, you can go online and find many, many different questions. And then what you do after the interview. So the objectives of an interview, and I know this is not only is networking sometimes uncomfortable for people initially, but marketing your skills or selling your skills. In other words, if you don't tell the person who's interviewing you why you are a good candidate, don't expect that they're going to figure it out through your resume or through your, your, the answers to your questions. You've got to tell them. You've got to be specific. And you've got to not be so afraid or shy about really bragging about what you've done. And, and again, for some people, that, that's not very comfortable. Another objective of the interview is not only for the person who's interviewing you to gather information about who you are and if you're a good fit for that particular position and, and that district, but also for you to gather information about the district and the job. Because you don't want to go on an interview without having a really good understanding of what the district is all about. Go on their website at a minimum. If you know people who work there, talk to them. You know, what's their mission statement? What do, you know, what do they hold? What do they value? What do they put on their website as, as something that is important to them? So in addition to marketing your skills, gathering information, it's also a way for you and them to determine the fit. And what do I mean about fit? Fit is essentially, is this the school district that you would want to work in? Is this a school district who uh, maybe whose philosophy of classroom management is similar to yours? Is, is this a district, and vice versa, are you going to be a good fit for what the principal holds important? And if you, don't know, if you don't find out before the interview what the principal finds important, that might be a question for you to ask. And I know that, that for most of us, we want to just get the job. But you also want to get a job in, in some place that you're going to be comfortable and you're going to feel valued and you think you're going to learn. So a screening interview, and those are the kinds of interviews that, for those of you who go to teacher job fair, 
and that's going to be, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second when that's going to be, those kind of 20 to 25 minute interviews, those are going to be screening interviews. And the purpose of a screening interview is to figure out whether or not you're going to go on to the next stage. So the questions that they ask in that type of interview, and usually they ask the same questions of everybody, are, are very specifically geared towards finding out information about you. Again, kind of what, what the fit is. Selection or on-site interviews. This is after you've passed the first one, where you, may, where you go to the school district possibly. You may have two or three interviews, possibly a group interview. You might have a community tour. It might be a half a day, or it might, you might have to teach a lesson. Do they, they still do that? They want you to teach a lesson. They would actually want you to teach a lesson. So it's, it's a much more in-depth interview than the screening interview. So a typical interview, opening remarks. That might be when they walk you to the interview room. Questions by the interview, questions by the interviewee, and, and closing remarks. And I want to stress, you want to make sure, and this, this happens through your research, you want to have questions. And there are examples of questions in both of these guides. Never ever answer the question, so what questions do you have for me with, hmm, you've, uh, I think you've answered you know, everything that, that I need to know. You know, and, and you want to make sure also that you don't ask questions that you should have been able to get the answer by looking at the, at the, um, the website or if they have any kind of an orientation. And closing remarks, closing remarks can vary, but oftentimes they're going to be what's the next step. If they don't tell you what the next step is, then you want to ask the next step. Or it could be what else do you have, is there anything else that you want to say? And that might be the time that you actually close the deal. Talk about, all right, I understand that this is what you're looking for in a candidate and this is what I, I would have to offer. That's kind of oversimplifying it, but if you're given an opportunity to really let them know, number one, I'm interested, and number two, these are the, the qualities, let me repeat the qualities that I have that I think are make me a good candidate, you know, use that. Preparation for interviews, and as I said before, interviewing really is practicing. M uh, many of us are not necessarily good and I oftentimes hear, oh, I don't need to do a mock interview, or I don't need to practice, because I'm really good at talking with people. Well, an interview is not just talking to people. It's a very intentional interview. The questions that are developed for most interviews are developed to find out specific things. So it's not just a conversation. Now, the style of the interviewer may very well be conversational and put you at ease, but what they're looking for is not just, well, let, let's have a conversation and see what comes out. They want to know specific things. So, for example, identify your strengths and weaknesses. Anybody been asked that before? Nobody's been asked? Tell me, give me one strength, give me one weakness, or give me three strengths and three weaknesses. That is not a question that you want to develop an answer to after they've asked it to, of you. You want to develop those answers beforehand. Now, strengths, and you want to be specific. Strengths would not be, well, I'm really good at dealing with people. Very, very vague. Tell me, give me an example of that. You know, for example, when I work in a group, I'm the one who usually organizes the time schedule because that's one of my strengths. Weaknesses, do not turn a strength into a weakness. I work too hard. I'm a perfectionist because people are afraid. Now, again, I don't want you to give them your deepest, darkest weakness, but what is something that you've worked on? If you have made it a point to develop a certain, you know, computer skill, you know, talk, talk about that. Talk about how you identified it and what you did to make it into more of a strength. So be, you know, again, be specific. Did somebody tell you um, in a class that, you know, you're, I would really like to give you this particular project, but I'm a little bit concerned that maybe you're not as comfortable talking to a large group of people that you sh as you should be if you're a teacher? Hmm, okay, interesting. So what did you do? You know, maybe joined Toastmasters, maybe you made it a point to be the one who was always the, the leader who spoke in front of a group. You know, again, what have you identified as a weakness and what have you done to make sure that you have been able to, um, you know, grow that weakness into more of a strength? Does that make sense? 
Because I guarantee you, if you say, oh, you know, I, if you, again, if you turn that strength into a weakness, that's really not what I want to hear. I'm asking that question, and you ought to ask yourself this sometimes. Why do they ask these questions? Why does a principal or a teacher ask another teacher this question? Probably because they want to know, they want to know if I criticize you or if I ask you to please develop you know, this particular area, are you going to be able to do that? Remember, past behavior is a good indication of, of what you're going to do in the future. So if you're used to working on and you're comfortable working on some of your weaknesses, then when I, as your supervisor, ask you to work on it, you're going to feel more comfortable. Develop your story. And part of that is what I was talking about before. Um, you know, think about if, if you know that this particular teaching position requires good organizational skills or requires an understanding of technology. I'm going to ask you questions about that. And I would like for you to give me some specific examples. So give me, you know, give me an, or walk me through how you dealt with students who may be preoccupied with something else and you want them to focus on, you know, another project. You know, you actually talk about what was the story, what was the action, what was the result. Anticipate gaps or problems. If the job requires that you have certain experience and maybe in this particular computer area and you don't, or maybe you don't have quite the strong language skills that, that they're looking for, you know, again, talk about how possibly in the past you have learned something new so that they know that you have the ability to do that. So clearly define your goals. Where do you see yourself five years from now? Where do you see yourself ten years from now? Because not only do I want to be able to look at your resume and figure out why you want to be a teacher, I want to know that this is, you know, you know where do you see yourself five years from now? I'm, I'm going to, you know, have my master's. I, you know, I hope to have been able to, you know, travel abroad or, or whatever it is, but be very specific. And then again, consider the match. Is this a job that you're interested in or is this a district that you're interested in? Make sure you've researched the school and the school district so that they ask you specific questions. Like what do you, what do you know about our district or what, what interests you in it? You're not going to be going, well, gee, I wish I had done what, what Jennifer McLaughlin had told me to do, but I didn't. And then prepare questions for the interviewer. Write them down. Write those questions down. And it's okay. Do you have a problem if they actually because then I know that you have prepared if you open up a notebook and, and, and actually do that. And then anticipate the most likely asked questions. That's why, for example, if you look in this guide or the other guide, the kinds of questions that are asked in there are pretty standard. And the stories that you've developed, let's say if you develop something about classroom management or a particular lesson plan that you developed that was very innovative, that, those kinds of stories can be used for many different questions, but you want to make sure, again, that you've prepared those before you actually have your interview. So behavioral interviewing. As I said before, the interviewer will ask for past examples of your behavior. The CAR method, context, action, take, and result. And I'll be sending you this PowerPoint so you don't have to worry about writing it down. Or the STAR method, situation, task, action, result. So if I say, walk me through a time, or tell me what your room um, would look like as a teacher. You know, what, what would be important to you? How would it be set up? Or give me an example of a time, as I, as I mentioned before, when you had to deal with a parent who was very upset with something that you did. I want to know a specific example. So the context is, what's the story? And these are probably a minute and a half to two minute answers. They're not, you know, just 30 second quick off the cuff. Give me the story so that I understand fully what it was about, how you were feeling, maybe what the attitude of the teacher, of the, of the parent was. What did you do? What was, what was the action? I did this. And again, you want to you use the word I. What, what did you do? And then what were the results? I would suggest that you probably want to try and pick one that had positive, a positive result rather than a negative result. You know, and it turned out, you know, this way. Now, once in a while, you're going to be asked a question, you know, can you tell me about um, a class that, that you um, developed that maybe didn't turn out quite as, as good as you wanted it to? Now, they're not trying to ask you to 
talk about you know something that is horrible and and may put yourself in a bad light what are they trying to do what's what's the person trying to figure out if you what did you learn from it and so that's the thing what what is the what was the situation what was the class that you developed that didn't turn out quite as well as you thought so what did you learn from it what would you do again or what have you done and you know what what are you going to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again Okay? Because I want to know that, because we all make mistakes and we all do things that, that don't always work out, but I want to know that you're one of those people that learns from it and grows from it and doesn't get completely devastated. So tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. You know, another question that many people don't really like. But tell me about yourself. Again, not one of those that you ought to sit there and make up the answer right then. Again, a one and a half, probably to two minute answer. So think, think about it. What do you want them to know about you? It doesn't necessarily have to be all about teaching, but maybe three, you know, maybe a couple of, think of it as bullet points. What are some of the highlights of your time here at Miami? Or has anybody studied abroad? Okay. Was that Tell me a little bit about that. Was that life changing for you? What'd you learn? I mean, was it, did you student teach abroad? Or you took a class abroad? Okay. So, so again, think about it. It could be study abroad. How many, does anybody volunteer in an organization that they've been involved in for a long time and it means, kind of means the world to you? Who do you, who do you volunteer with? Humane Society. Okay, so you could talk about, okay, there are three things I'd like you to know about me. I studied abroad in Belize or Luxembourg. Um, I am a active volunteer with the Humane Society, and I am also a student athlete. Uh, I'm just kind of making this up. And then you go through and you actually talk about it. You know, in my in my work with the Humane Society, I've worked with them since I was in high school, and then talk about what you did, talk about what you've learned, how does that relate to maybe your teaching experience. If you've student taught already, or you, you know, you, you, you've taught a particular group of students for a while, you know, again, this is something that you want to already have developed. What are those bullet points from my work experience, from my intern experience, from my student teaching experience, from my outside life. If I, anybody work for 20 hours or more a week? Okay. Um, some of you work a lot. What, you know, what have you learned? Because you have worked 20 hours a week, maybe you don't have the opportunity to have as much experience with student organizations, but it probably has had a big impact on who you are. Talk about it. How does that relate to becoming a teacher, or why did, why did you decide you wanted to become a teacher? What are your major strengths and weaknesses? I would come up with three of each. Why do you want to be a teacher? And that, that could be something that you would put in your, you know, your tell me about yourself. Or that could be a question that they would ask you instead of tell me about yourself. But again, remember, this is what they're trying to figure out. If I ask you why do you want to be a teacher, not a question that you should have to think too hard about. And, you know, again, what does this tell me about you? Why have you chosen to interview with our school system? You know, that, that's all a part of researching. What do you know about this school district? Why would you think that you want to work there? What's the greatest asset you will bring to your classroom and profession? And that's, that's, that's a hard question, you might think, but, but certainly not an unreasonable one. And then be honest, but focus on positive qualities. So in other words, if they ask you a question and you don't necessarily have quite the experiences they're looking for, don't, you know, don't beat yourself up. Again, if it's something that you could learn easily because you have learned other things in the past, you know, maybe talk about that. Be punctual. Maybe be 10, 15 minutes early to the interview. So if you don't know where the school district is, you don't know where the school is, you want to make sure, and I would not rely on MapQuest or Google. I would actually drive by there to see, you know, where it is, where I'm going to park, find out if you need a parking pass, etc. Because once you, now if you, if you're involved in an accident, heaven forbid, or you're behind somebody in an accident, make sure that you call and let them know, don't just, you know, be, be late, let them know why. Dress professionally and conservatively. 
you more so probably than a lot of other professions need to, you know, men suit and tie, women um, jacket, you know, suit, um, dress in a nice jacket. Um, I think I've lost the hose argument, but I personally think you should wear a hose if you're going to wear a skirt, but I seem to have lost that. And if not, see, I'm looking, look, 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 look. That, I haven't gotten a reaction from some of you from the whole night, and I mention hose, and it's like, <sighs> so. If you don't want to wear hose, then wear pants. But anyway, <laughs> um, listen carefully to questions. Don't assume that you know what somebody's going to ask. Make sure you understand specifically what they're asking and then answer that question. And don't be afraid of some silence, yours and the interviewers. If you need to think for a second about an answer rather than going, um, hmm. Hmm, interesting question. Take a moment to think about it. And if your interviewer is um, taking a moment to uh, be, think about it also, don't, don't be too concerned. Don't, don't try to immediately fill the silence with conversation. Be positive about former coworkers and supervisors. You may get asked a question, you know, give me, you know, t tell me a little bit about the hardest um, supervisor you've ever had or the most difficult coworker you've ever had. And even if they deserve to be slammed, don't. Remember what I was talking about before, if you're asked something, if you're asked to talk about something that is a little bit negative or didn't turn out quite as well, think about it that way. If you had a supervisor who was very difficult, what'd you learn? How did you, for example, I had a boss one time who would come in, give me a project, and not tell me what the, the dates were, when, when the, the deadlines were, what she was expecting. She did that a couple of times. She'd come back and say, so what's, what's going on? And I said, well, I, I didn't realize you needed it. So what I eventually would do is when she would bring something in, I would work up a timeline. I would make a meeting with her. And I'd say, OK, let, let's talk about what you need, who this is for, and when you need it by. So I, as far as I'm concerned, took a negative situation and turned it into a positive so that I could deal with it and she could get what she wanted. Now, I could have just said, oh, for God's, you know, I could have said, let me tell you about this, you know, horrible, horrible woman. But I didn't. You know, I, I, I talked about her, and you shouldn't either. You should identify, you know, somebody that was difficult, they didn't show up on time, um, maybe if, if it was a coworker. But again, what did you do? What did you learn from it? And how did you, how did you deal with it so that you can continue to work there? So because if you do start slamming somebody, bad-mouthing somebody, I'm going to think to myself, hmm, if you do it to them, you're going to do it to me. And I, it, it's, it's just not good form. It really just isn't good form to, to talk about former coworkers in a bad way. Watch your nonverbal communication. You know, see if you, that's why I want you to come and do a video. I'm not going to do a video if you kind of you know, do your hair or you um, have some kind of you twist a lot. Like I notice up here, I'm doing a lot of back and forth and back and forth. Um, so what you know? What are your nonverbal communications? And and watch those, especially if they're if they're annoying. Note the interviewer's name. Why? Why do you note the interviewer's name? Follow up. And oftentimes it's good to say that person's name. You're going to send a thank you note, thank you card. Get a business card if they have it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, bring a resume reference list just in case if you haven't already done it and your portfolio. And I'm going to put um, Dr. Eagle on the spot to talk about portfolios because those are, those are extremely uh, controversial. So concluding the interview, reiterate your, your interest. You don't have to say that you want it, but you can say, you know, thank you very much. I really am excited about this particular position. Again, if you're given the opportunities, I think I am a good candidate because of the experience I've had, you know, in X, Y, and Z. And then inquire about the timeline. You know, what's, what's the next step? When can I expect to hear from you if they haven't told you already? Because if you don't, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to figure out, okay, I haven't heard from them in, in two weeks. That must mean that I didn't do a good job. But if you know that they're not going to be making a decision for a month, then, then you'll feel a little bit better. Or if you know that they're going to be making a decision in two weeks and it's two and a half weeks, you can feel more comfortable about, about following up and finding out where they are in the process. After the interview, evaluate your performance. Now, in your field, handwritten, letter, note, email, what do you think? 
Go ahead. What? Handwritten. Handwritten note. What do you think? Who else? Anybody email it? Some people will say do both. You know, email something right away in case they're going to be making a decision quickly and then follow up with a handwritten note. What would you, what would, what's your preference, Dr. Eagle? I like the idea Okay. Okay. But you definitely like the handwritten note. Okay. And again, your, your feel probably more than others, I mean, because it's everything, in, in my opinion, because it's so relationship oriented. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it can make a difference. It really can. The thing, if you are, you know, again, like the pantyhose, if you don't, don't agree with me on that, do something. Don't, I mean, don't, and excuse me for the double negative, but don't not, do not not send something. That, that would be considered extremely um, horrible faux pas. So other references that you can find online, interview, we have another interviewing guide that's more in depth a mock interview. If you have some questions about interviewing and you want to make an appointment with me, I'm happy to meet with you. Um, also, if you get an opportunity to do a mock interview with a principal or somebody when you're student teaching, take them up on it. Because the more styles that you can, you can get used to, the better. Uh, interviewing workshops like the one that you're, you're at now. And I also wanted to tell you that because you have come to this workshop, you're going to get an email from our office saying that you now are eligible for, um, to sign up for a mock interview and to participate in on-campus interviews. On-campus interviews are probably not going to be as important to you all unless uh, you're thinking about interviewing for another kind of position that's not in education. But the mock interviews, yes. And this workshop takes care of the requirement that, that you have that. Uh, we're over in Hoyt Hall. That's where our main office is. I'm in Hoyt, and I'm also in Phillips. And as I, I don't know if I said this or not, but I'm more than happy to stay after 5 o'clock for those of you who are student teaching. That, that's usually not a problem. Teacher job fair is going to be Thursday, April 3rd from 8 to 5. And if you're, who's student teaching next? Are you student teaching now? Okay. If anybody's student teaching next semester, um, usually there is no problem. In, it's an excused absence. You just want to make sure you talk early enough in the semester about it so that, that they're prepared for it. And this is different than our other career fairs because you're going to from 8 to 8, excuse me, from 8.30 to 9.30, you will be going around to the different school districts signing up for interviews. And for the rest of the day, you will come back and you'll have 20 minute, 25 minute interviews with different school districts. So that, that's, what's, that's what's different. So make sure, try to, try to take the whole day, because you'll never know, you never know what's, what's going to happen. Well, good evening. Thank you for coming. We appreciate you being here, and we appreciate your interest in education and getting that first job. So we have a couple of questions here that Jennifer mentioned a little bit earlier, the use of social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and other ways that you reach out to prospective employers in terms of your job search. My recommendation here is make sure that you keep your personal and your professional lives on social media completely separate. When I do a seminar with field students, one of the first things I say is clean up your Facebook page, take down anything the least bit controversial because if you think teachers and principals and other school personnel will not see your Facebook page, you're mistaken. You don't want to be caught with anything on your Facebook page or in any sort of social media context that would be embarrassing and might cost you an opportunity to get an interview and to eventually get a position. So I would say use them with caution and make sure that you've cleaned up your personal site before you go on and create a professional page on Facebook. Lots and lots of student teachers are getting into LinkedIn. Lots of professionals are now involved in LinkedIn. Again, be careful who you connect with in terms of social media. The application process. What's the best way to make an initial contact with a school or school district. I would suggest going to the website of the school that you're interested in, 
the vast majority have some sort of employment opportunities or something similar to that on the home page in a header. You click on that, many times it will automatically take you to AppleTrack or whatever their online application process is. They'll also list the vacancies and what they call anticipated vacancies. We talked a little bit earlier about how uh, January, February is when vacancies begin to occur. That's most likely because a district is offering a retirement incentive. If a teacher submits their letter of retirement or resignation by such and so date, say January 31st, they're eligible for a bonus. So that encourages them to let the district know early because districts want to know early so they can get a jump on filling vacancies with really high quality candidates. Who should you contact first? Principal, superintendent, or human resources? Again, look at the website. If a district is large enough to have a human resource director, contact that individual first because that person is responsible for all of the hiring. That is their job. Both principals and superintendents have so many other things on their plate. They are absolutely interested in filling those vacancies, but they have so many other responsibilities. And the HR individual is really going to have the most information in terms of vacancies. Jennifer touched a little bit on this as well. When should I begin my job search? If you're graduating in December, you need to be thinking about what you want to do now. I was a December graduate way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I substitute taught for a semester, and then I worked with a school that was a year-round school, so I did some substitute teaching in the summer months as well. Substitute teaching for December grads is a great way to get yourself out there, to get to know districts and schools, and for those individuals to get to know you. You can get a jump on those vacancies if you're in the buildings on a regular basis. May grads start to look in February, March. Think about what you want to do, where you want to go. The difference in a May grad and a December grad, schooling is almost a seasonal employment career because we hire typically between May and August. In that way, it's very different from your peers who are in business, in arts and sciences. We only hire seasonally. So in May, you know that those vacancies are beginning to really come out there and they're going to be filled by the people who are eager and who get themselves out there in a very fast pace. August grads, You'll probably be looking at substitute teaching as well, but again, it's a great way of getting yourself out there, familiar, familiarizing yourself with a school and with a district. Electronic recruiting systems. Many of the large urbans in the area have consortia. They work with so many substitutes and they have so many employment opportunities, not just for teachers, but for administrators and classified personnel that they are in consortia. So Dayton Area School Consortium has been around for many, many years and they list regular as well as substitute teaching positions. Cincinnati also has a consortium. And then Butler County recently has gone to what's known as AppleTrack. AppleTrack is search soft software, and it is a way that you can apply to as many districts in Butler County, or as few as you would like. So in many ways, it's easier for you to apply for a job because you're no longer stuffing hard copies of your resume and applications into envelopes and sending them off in the mail, but also know that there are many, many, many other applicants who are doing exactly the same thing. When I was working in HR, it was not unusual for an early childhood position to have over 600 applicants because what people tend to do is apply for everything. So my words of wisdom in terms of something like AppleTrack is really sort and filter. 
do you really want to apply for all of the preschool to third grade positions in every single school in Butler County, or do you want to be more selective? If you're more selective, I think it benefits you as well as the school district. When applying, choose not only the county, but the individual schools below the county. That's what we were just talking about. You can apply to every school, but is every school going to be a good fit? And what you want, most likely not. Keep that application updated. If something changes, if your phone number changes, if you move, if you get an endorsement, make sure that you update that because when HR folks are looking for candidates, they put those filters in. For example, you go and get your master's degree and I'm doing a filter as an HR director, I'm only going to interview candidates with a master's degree. If you don't update, then you would be excluded in that search. And only apply if you're qualified. Don't overstate yourself. There's nothing worse than misrepresenting yourself. If an employer finds out about that, it is really detrimental to your career. Electronic recruiting systems, again, it's a good way of getting your name out to lots and lots of districts and lots of schools, but don't count solely on that. Jennifer really gave you some great advice when she talked about networking and using the personal contacts because after all, schooling is a relational business and it's about meeting people and talking with people face to face. If I knew of someone who was looking for a job, they had been a substitute, they'd been a student teacher in my building, I would certainly look to them first and not start sorting on Applitrack through those 600 plus applications. It is a relational business, so don't just rely on the online application systems. Differences, this area of the state seems to use Applitrack. There really aren't that many differences. They all permit you to upload uh, resumes and typically one or two reference letters. Don't over upload. You wanna give them just exactly what they want. Make sure that you are accurate when you put your information in because this goes to many, many, many schools and districts. If you make a spelling error, or again, if you misrepresent yourself, it's not just going to one school or district. You are blanketing the area with that. So you wanna make sure that everything is accurate. So we talked a little bit about those tips. Once you apply online, what's the best way to follow up? I would again go back to those websites. When a position is filled, it gets pulled off the website. If you don't get a call and you don't hear and a position is filled, they most likely went through a screening process and for some reason decided not to pull your application and not to give you a call for an interview. That's okay. You can't expect to get an interview for every position that you apply for. That's unrealistic. So references, actual letters of reference and to include them in your portfolio. We moved this year in the student teaching office for the first time to asking our supervisors and cooperating teachers both to write reference letters. We used to have something called the final narrative and what we were finding was schools were no longer asking for this written narrative that cooperating teachers would write about your student teaching experience. What Applitrack and others wanted was a reference letter. So absolutely, you need to get those cooperating teachers, the first person you get a reference letter from, because they're most familiar with your work in the classroom. The second person should be your supervisor, because they are also very familiar with your work in the classroom. Then you can consider a faculty member, maybe somebody who you had for content block, who knows you well, and if your principal of the building where you've been student teaching is familiar with you, you might ask your principal. But only ask people who are really familiar with your experiences in the classroom and can really speak to those. Who should be included on your reference page? Again, number one is your cooperating teacher. 
Number two, supervisor. Number three, again, faculty or principal, the same people that you get those references from. So pros and cons of portfolios. Back in the day, hard portfolios that were like scrapbooks were all the rage and everyone took them to their interviews and sometimes they sat on a table during an interview. The skilled student teachers and pre-service teachers used those to support themselves when they were answering questions during an interview process. Electronic in chalk and wire and others, it's a little bit more difficult to access that during an interview. But again, if you're going to go to the trouble to create a portfolio, you want to be able to use it in the most effective manner. So when you go to the interview, get it out. Use it as supporting evidence when you're asked a question. If you're asked one of those questions that Jennifer alluded to earlier, that you have an extended response opportunity, find the supporting material in your either electronic portfolio or your hard copy portfolio. Structured interviews. The teacher perceiver, lots and lots of districts still use teacher perceiver. Some districts use teacher perceiver, and it is from Gallup, as a screening tool. Other districts use it when they get to an end of an interview process, and they want to make sure that the candidate has those dispositions and those assets that will make that individual a good fit and a good teacher. I would say probably in this area of the state, at least 50% of the districts still use teacher perceiver. There's really no way to study for it. It's one of those opportunities where you just give them your gut answer. There are no right or wrong answers. Again, they're looking for a fit. So good luck. Any questions that either Jennifer or, or I can answer for you? You're about to embark on a really exciting journey. Don't get disappointed. It's long. It's tough. But there are jobs out there. So I want to wish all of you the best of luck. My office is 200 McGuffey. Most of you know where I am. I'm absolutely open to you coming in and asking questions, sending me an email. It's Eagle J or giving me a call, it's 529-7245. So once again, good luck and thanks for coming. Yes. You know, it's not so much the question, it's, what's, it's what the question demonstrates. So if you're a third grade teacher, I think a good question would be, I noticed on the website that you made a dramatic rise in your third grade math scores. What strategies did your teachers employ to raise those test scores? So make it an opportunity for you to demonstrate that you know about the district, you know specifically about the class, and then you can also say, oh, so they use investigations. When I was student teaching, we used investigations and we used this particular strategy as well. So use that opportunity. But I think specific concrete questions are always good. The questions that always annoyed me as a principal is what time does the school day start? What time do we get out? When spring break? Those are the kind of questions that show me you're more interested in not being there than being there. So again, it's all about engagement and being involved. Okay. Ah, I see one. Yes. If you graduate in December, yes, you are welcome to come back. You can come back for the rest of your life. <laughs> Yes. To, to send a thank you out there. I think as soon as you get out of that interview, you can send an email. 
And in this day and age with a smartphone, you've got the names of everybody who was on that interview team. Send them an email. Thank you for the opportunity. I enjoyed meeting you. I look forward to hearing from you soon. I hope to be a part of your team, something to that effect. Then in a day or two, you can send that thank you note. The nice thing about the thank you note is it gets your name out a second time. It's a hard copy, it's something tangible that the principal or the HR director can you know, put on a table and your name is out there again. Anything that sets you apart from your peers is a good thing. Yes. Teacher Perceiver was developed by Gallup, so it's a survey, and it basically is looking at dispositional assets. Things like, I, I love children, I wanna be a part of a community, I believe in the community of learners, I believe that it takes a village to educate, those kind of things, and, and then you are scored on a Likert scale, I strongly agree with this, to I strongly disagree with this. And, Different it, HR folks have to be trained in interpreting the results of that. It's pretty sophisticated. And one of the reasons I think a lot of districts still use it is it's a significant investment in time and money to train folks to be able to interpret those teacher perceiver results. It's nothing you can study for. You just answer honestly and submit it to the, usually it's HR that gives you those teacher perceivers. Thank you.